Hello everybody and welcome to a very special episode of Movies to Movies where we are going to review The Hateful Eight. Uh, Caleb, uh, me, you, and Mr. Bush here, Nathan Bush, say hello. Hello. Hey. Uh, yeah, we uh, saw a special early screening of The Hateful Eight um, this past week and uh, we thought we'd review it for you guys. Um Caleb, uh, let's start with you. Uh, what did you think? Uh, just some opening thoughts. Uh, don't have to go into detail, but uh, uh, about the hateful eight. What, what would you give the movie um, on a scale of one to five? That quickly? Uh, yes, we're, we'll we'll discuss it in a little bit. But uh, I get it out of five. Yeah, what would you give uh, it out of a five? Well, it's, it's, here's the thing. It's one of those things where I had problems with it when I walked out. Uh, but then the more I thought about it, there were st- scenes that stuck in my head. Like there were scenes that I'm like, I'm like you know what? I'd really wouldn't mind watching that in theaters again because it was such a blast. Mm-hmm. I'd give it almost a perfect score because I found it to be Quentin Tarantino's fourth best movie. Uh, so I give it a 4.8 out of 5 because I liked it a lot with the exception of just a couple things. Okay. Uh, you give it a, what, what was it again? 4.8 out a of 5. 4.8 out of 5. That's a pretty high score uh, for from you, Mr. Luther. Uh, you don't throw... I throw five. high scores out like that. I throw some fives often. around. I've, I've given about five fives this year. Uh, so. Okay, Mr. Bush, what would what would you give the movie? I mean, I love Tarantino. I, I love every pretty much every movie he's ever made that I've seen. Um, Tarantino's one of my top three favorite directors. Um, for Tarantino movie, it was amazing. I mean, it's just a, it's every Tarantino movie to me is amazing. Um, Four point eight actually is pretty spot on. Like, it's not perfect. There's maybe, like, if you want to go nitpicking, you can find a couple little things here and there. And because it's so long, there's going to be more room for, for you to, to gripe. But I'll go 4.82 because that's, that's, or not 4.82, but 4.8 also. Try that's, to one-up me. Yeah, that's a solid, that's a good score, though, because I think it, it, it's some, it's pretty much shares my opinion on the movie as well, that score, which we'll get into a little bit later with detail. We'll, into, we'll, we'll take a spoiler uh, route here. We'll take a spoiler oh, route here. Yeah, we're, we're definitely route. there'll definitely be some spoilers yeah. coming up, but we will give you uh, plenty enough time to uh, to get away from that when we start about it, like this is just our opening uh, statement. I'm actually going to give it a little, about a four out of five. Actually, mm-hmm. uh, there was a few things that I, I uh, that I was I didn't really care for, um, which we'll get we'll get into here in a little bit. Um, it wasn't. I don't think it was Tarantino's best movie. I don't even think it was in his top five best movies. But uh, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, so, uh, Caleb, uh, let's go ahead and talk about um, why you gave the movie a four point well, eight. Now we can just have like a like a group discussion overall right. about things that, about the movie that we loved and things that uh, we didn't love. Well, first off, it, it sets up like perfectly, I think, in terms of Tarantino movie, and it's it's the only Tarantino movie with a musical score. And the guy who did this, his name is a very, very foreign name that's very, very hard to read, but it's it's sort of like Enio Mor- Mor- Morricone, and he did the score to the uh, the, the thing. He also did the, the score to Scarface. He actually well. didn't did not he do did? that. No, he did not. Uh, I looked that up. Now he didn't do the score to that. Well, he did. A, he what other movies did he do the score to? Uh, I'm I almost sure he did. A, he he used to do a lot of we- like spaghetti westerns. Uh, he didn't. He didn't do Scarface. Okay, but yeah, though. I'm not thinking Scarface. That was yeah. He didn't do that. But he, bad. here's the, here's why I bring up the thing is that there's a there's a track from the thing called Bestiality, and it wasn't used in the thing, and he uses it in in this movie. He uses it, and it's 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 an Wait amazing. Wait a minute. He he did uh he did the thing to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Did he? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he Hold did on, the I'm theme on, to the good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, I'm on his uh, Wikipedia page right now. Yes, because Wikipedia is perfect. The ecstasy of gold is what I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, I believe he did. Let me look real quick. But uh, like I was saying, he did. He put in bestiality from the Thing soundtrack, which actually wasn't used in the Thing movie, uh, which is a movie that I, I really, really love. But uh, it's used in a very pivotal scene in the Hateful Eight here. Uh, a scene that I'm not sure Joss liked as much as me and you, yeah. but uh, but like I said, it, it sets up pretty perfectly in terms of characters. You, you you're introduced to Samuel Jackson's character and uh, Kurt Russell's character first, and Jason, Jennifer Jason Lee's character. And right off the bat, you learn that Jennifer Jason Lee is despicable and she's awful. She she's just she's just awful. And you learn that Kurt Russell, she's gonna go take her to to hang her. He's a bounty hunter, and so is uh, Samuel Jackson, whose horse couldn't make it through the the tough tough winter. So he asked for a, a ride and. And Kurt Russell's a little giddy up there. <laughs> All right. Um, 
That we'll, we'll get into yeah. that here in a little yeah. bit. That's just the premise of the movie. Yeah, that, just, that just sets it up. It just sets the set yeah. up to me. Nathan, what about you? My my problem my my problems with the movie can't be like really talked about till we get into the spoiler yeah. part. So I mean, <laughs> me too. Like without spoiling anything, it's kind of hard to talk about the movie. But you can just we, talk about the, the mood I mean, of the movie and the overall movie. There's like, the way that it makes the so, it's so. a solid. It's a, it's just a solid movie, and it's like it's Tarantino is one of those guys that when he makes a movie. Everything you see is going to be, most of the time, everything you're going to see is going to be, like, stylized to the time period of which he's doing, except for two things, and that's the dialogue and the music. Yeah. The music actually worked this time, but of course the dialogue was a little different. Well, it had a score that, that really, like, yeah. that it really helped develop the, the tension, the overall, because yeah. that's the best thing about the movie is the yeah. tension. Tarantino is the master of building tension with dialogue. Right. Yeah. There's nobody better. And I don't think he's done it better than he did right here, honestly. Yeah, because I really thought he did it well in Glorious Bastards, but in this movie he seemed to almost go out and do it better because of I guess the characters. You care more about the characters in this movie because there's only like there's like, there's eight of them. And it's more of a, a condensed cast where in, in Glorious Bastards, I mean God, the amount of characters it's was almost endless. A portal on experimental film yeah, at times. and and the Hateful Eight, it's just there's so much more tension because we get we delve so deeply into these characters and we know their backstories and we learn about them and we learn their characteristics and what they do and what they're about and how they feel and how they feel about each other and it's it's very it's just done so so well and my my feeling on the movie is like I can't wait to watch it again honestly because I mean I I'm afraid to watch it again as because normally you're never going to get as good as that first watch Especially when you know what's going on. For a Tarantino on. movie, with the exception of like Pulp Fiction. Yeah, you can watch Pulp Fiction good. over yeah, and over. Be as good. But that's going to be a tough one to watch again and enjoy it as much. But at the same time, I want to watch it again. Yeah, I've, so. I've seen where uh, people, a lot of people have compared this to like an Agatha Christie novel or like the, the Clue, the movie Clue. Like yeah. a, a Western version of like a gory Western version of, uh, of Clue. Yeah, and definitely. I think that's pretty spot on. Uh, it's probably a better movie than Clue as a whole. Oh, well, yeah. I'll yeah, but uh, only time will tell. <laughs> But yeah, uh, what, what did you what, what do you think about um, the setup and the way that it's presented and the way that it makes you feel, Josh? Um, I, I, it was I, I did like the the fact that it took place all in a um, a snowy scenery. Uh, actually, snowy scenery it, it would seem to be harder to film on than anything else, just for the simple fact of shadowing and um, the way of of it. It has to be brutal too. To film and act and all of these things on a a uh, on a snow field or in a mountainside or anything, and the fact that, that Quentin Tarantino wrote a whole film around that is, if if I'm not mistaken, he's never done that sort of scenery before in a movie and based a whole movie around it. Even though probably the only first third of the movie, the first two chapters take place in the scenery uh, in that snowy scenery, and the rest takes place in the uh, the haberdashery, yeah. uh, but that being said, it's the problem with why my uh, rating is so low is there's some things in the movie that doesn't seem to need to be there, and there's a few acting discrepancies that I just are unforgivable to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tim Roth, for instance, Tim Roth, absolutely. Uh, when not to spoil anything, when you f when when things happen with him. Uh, later on in the movie, then it's Tim Roth. In the first, it's explained a little, it's bit, explained better. A little yeah. better. But the, the first, the way, yeah. But yeah. the first two thirds of the movie, he is trying he's his best annoying. to be. Annoying. He's trying his best to be Christoph Waltz. Yeah. That's what it's trying to be, and yeah. it, it almost seems like the character was wrote for Christoph Waltz. But Christoph Waltz went and chose to do. Uh, um, Spectre. Spectre instead of the Hateful I, Eight. I, I'd almost believe that if it was a bigger role, but it's not a very big role, though. Uh, which it might have originally been, and they just condensed them a little bit whenever they couldn't I get guess it all, I Waltz. guess it all depends on how long it took yeah. for this movie to be filmed. Yeah. Um, and it says here, production, uh, production mostly likely began in the summer of 2014. Yeah, because there was a lot of uh, a lot of like rewrites, and the script got right. leaked, and it almost didn't happen. The movie right. didn't. And, and uh, I think for a, it for says a movie here, that, that went through such... 
pre-production hell. Like it, it was pretty successful at what it was trying to do. Uh, uh, another thing about it, the movie it that, didn't work as well on you as it did. Sometimes. Another thing about the movie that was so well was now, I, granted, it may have been the theater that we saw it in, but the movie takes place in a cold environment, and I felt it. It feels cold. Especially in, right. the, in the first little parts, I'd say the first like 30 to 40 minutes when they're in the snow and and, yeah. tra- and traveling to the haberdashery. Of course, once you get to the haberdashery, it still feels cold because you have to, they open up the doors and then you see the, the blizzard yeah. that's outside, like, you know, the one scene that's hilarious uh, yeah. where the guy comes busting in. Well, uh, yeah. It says, it says um, according to, uh, of course, it's the Wikipedia page and it can be, you know, it's edited true, and whatnot, but it's probably true. It's probably true. It says your principal photography began on December the 8th, 2014. So... Going back to the ten, the the uh, Christoph Waltz thing, Spectre was being filmed, yeah. like it was being filmed. So, you know, and probably with all the script rewrites and them having to delay the movie, and delay the movie, delay the movie, it still seems like to me that that was supposed to be for Christoph Waltz. And it, and it also feels like really cartoonish. And I'm not saying this movie is the most serious movie ever made, but there is some things grounded in reality, which lies with one of the couple problems that I have in the movie. And it's a problem that I've had with the past few Tarantino movies, ever since Kill Bill. Because in Kill Bill, that stylized violence that's just crazy and doesn't look realistic at all, that it's works. Not so, it's not supposed to. No, it works completely in right. Kill Bill. Then they do it in Glorious Bastards, which is them recreating like, history. And it's a movie that, that could be realistic. And then, then there's so much blood splatter and just ridiculous yeah. deaths, that, deaths that's played off more for comedy. And Django Unchained did the same thing with the exception of a few... Like slavery scenes, like because there's a couple like rough scenes in, in Django and Chain. Yes. But I'd say when the big shootouts come in Django and Chain, it's mostly played for comedy. And in here, it's almost exactly the same way. But for some reason, it didn't bother me as much because the movie feels way more, way more compact. It feels a lot tighter than in Glorious mm-hmm. Bastards. Like I was telling Nathan that the the scene in, Gl- in Glorious Bastards where they're playing the card game, uh, it's like they made a whole three hour movie out of that. Yeah. In in Hate Hate Flight, and it worked like. Come the end of the movie, I was like, you know what? I could watch another fifteen minutes of this. But right. the stylized violence always bothered me because I think if if the deaths would have felt more grounded in reality and looked more realistic, they would have been more impactful for me. Like I might would have felt a little bit more. But whenever you see, no spoiler here. I'm not. I'm not spoiling who dies here. But whenever you see someone's head get blown off, like it just feels way too like over the top. Like it feels like something that would be in Kill Bill. Uh, so that is a slight problem for me, and the other problem I'll have to talk about in the spoilers that we that we and going, going back to who we were talking about uh, score, uh, the guy who did the score, uh-huh. um, it wasn't Scarface. I was thinking yeah. the Untouchables. My bad. Yeah. Uh, I looked that up because I knew it, it was going to bug me until I did, um, which was also a Brian De Palma film mm-hmm. like Scarface. But uh, okay, so anyone have anything else they'd like to add before we get into the spoiler part? I want to say that we, we watched the, the 20 minute shorter version that was like 168 minutes so there was no intermission on this but you could tell where the intermission came into play. Yeah we'll get and that I, was that was the other and thing I, I was and I think I think that all the thing building into the intermission was, was really really great. I right. know it probably didn't work for some people but like I said they played that the bestiality song from the thing and right. that scene and that music is so creepy like it's it's so like eerie and Samuel Jackson tells this story that that you're not sure if you if you believe it right. or not because it's so detailed and it's one of those it's one of those little Tarantino things that that he adds in like in Pulp Fiction like what's mm-hmm. in the briefcase like you don't know if it's what's yeah. in the briefcase the problem the problem with that though for me was that the the cut that we watched if there wasn't going to be a intermission mm-hmm. in the cut then that shouldn't even have been in the film there was no point for it to be in we're, the film. We're not, we're not talking about the scene that I'm talking about, though. I'm talking about Samuel Jackson's like monologue. I'm talking about after the we scene get, after that. I'm I talking agree. about the scene after that. I think the scene after that where we, well, well, where the twenty intermission, the twenty we, minute intermission yeah. should have been between chapter three and four. Yeah, when we talk about the uh, when we get we talk about we'll spoilers. say what it is, but I, but I yeah. will say that that it felt out of place for this movie for this cut for this it cut felt, yeah. uh, because it felt like Tarantino doing something that he really wanted to do, regardless if it worked in the movie, right? Which a lot of I talked to someone the other day. That actually like loved that, right? And I'm like, like that's cool. I guess it just didn't work for me. Uh, and and the second that it ends, I'm over it. Mm-hmm. Like, cause it gets back into the story, which the, the third chapter gets gets crazy. Right. Uh, and and some of it, some of it good, some of it, some of it not so good. But yeah. Okay. So that being said, we're gonna give you a about a 15, 20 second uh, pause here with us. Uh, before we get into the spoilers, so uh, now would be a good time if you don't want to hear any spoilers about this movie to uh, click back or click off the screen or um, anything of that nature. You've got 20 seconds starting now. 
it. This is where we'll play. Meet me in the matinee. Da 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 I was doing the whole intro. I don't know what you were doing. I was doing existential reflection. Oh hell, I don't know. I was just being stupid. I was doing Dragon's Twist. All right, we're back. Apparently, we were having our our band meeting moment here. Yeah, we do that. But anyway, okay, so it's time for the spoilers of The Hateful Eight. Uh, Caleb, let's go ahead and talk about uh, what we thought of the movie. Uh, we'll start it right at the very beginning. It's a three-hour movie. But we're going to try and cut this. We're at 15 minutes in the video. Okay. Uh, so let's try and keep this underneath uh, 30, minutes. 30, 35 okay. minutes. Uh, so Samuel L. Jackson is a bounty hunter. Um, yes. Which I don't think the plot necessarily, like all that stuff is... Like, I think a lot of people know what they're getting themselves into. They, they're they in the haberdashery, and, and someone isn't who they say they are. Right. One of the per- people in there is very likely there to, to, to get Jace, Jennifer Jason Lee out of right. the hanging. Who is, it's uh, just a matter of knowing who it is. And there's Daisy there's, Dahmer goo in there's the There's really no way of knowing. Uh, right. And there's just... Can we talk about the, the brutality that Kurt Russell displays on this female character? And y- you, fi- you feel a bit torn because, you know, it's not... It's not good. To, it's not it's a not good, good thing. But but you almost back him because just how despicable that this woman. Like he'll come out of nowhere with a left hand. And just yeah, he will her. beat the shit yeah. out of this woman. Yeah, it was pretty violent. Like I actually like, but I, their relationship was 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 what we was weird. Uh, it was in a what good we way. expected in a good way because you see how he treats her whenever he's not beating her, like cleaning her face off and and getting her food and stuff. It's an odd relationship, almost, but, but it works it's for almost Tarantino. Like a, really uh, works. For, for him, it's also a, almost a split personality thing where he yeah. he feels sympathy yeah. by doing that, but at the same time, he will beat the ch- out of her in two seconds yeah. and not think twice about it. Um, let's uh, Honestly, we need to get in, and I want to talk about, uh, about uh, 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 Walton Goggins. Oh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. He absolutely Walt stole Goggins. the show in this movie. Uh, here's the thing with Walton Goggins is that at the beginning of it, he's well, he's Walton Goggins. He's the yeah, character. Yes. He's the racist character. You see him in everything and yep. Justified and in Django. Yep. He's despicable. And you, he's saying some funny things, but you hate him. And yep. honestly, by the end of the movie, he's the best person in the movie, and you actually like him a pretty yeah, good Walt, lot. Walton Goggins absolutely stole the show yeah. in this movie. Um, he is. No question about but, it. Uh, he says some of the funniest stuff in the movie. Uh, he really does. Uh, and... Honestly, any scene that he's in, and of course he's in every scene in the movie practically, except for the the um, uh, the flashback. The scene. flashback. There's a scene, flashback scene uh, yeah. with Bruce Dern and uh, Samuel Jackson, and uh, and uh, they steal the sh- like. It's absolutely any any scene that he's in. He's absolutely he just steals the show. It's his movie, particularly. Uh, Right when the second half of the movie starts, which is where we we have the issue where Quentin Tarantino right. gives a little bit of a narrative, like his own voice yeah, explains he's, things. He's like, "Okay, let's let's go back now." I'm Quentin Tarantino. Let's, yeah, go, let's back go back a little, a little bit. bit. Let's go back 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Where it shows this Jennifer Jason Lee while while Samuel Jackson is giving a, a crazy speech with that soundtrack going on. Uh, to try and intimidate Bruce Dern. I, th- I think I-, I don't believe in the things he was saying. I just think he was trying to get Bruce Dern worked up, and it worked because he he kills Bruce Dern. <laughs> he kills him. At the same time, though, when, now that I, now when I sit and think about it, the uh, the the chapter which picks up uh, uh, Domer Domer Goose got a secret. That's where that picks up is chapter four. Yeah. The that intermission coming back from it. Almost has to be done because it's a pivotal plot point of the movie. Somewhat of who poisoned the coffee. It's a, it, it is a pivotal plot point now. I understand why they did. It. I just think yeah, it was Tarantino. Like that was something that he's been wanting to do in one of his movies it's for do, a long it's do a time. Flashback. And he yes. did it. And and it might not have worked as well for me. But once you leave that and you, you see Jennifer Jason Lee put poison in the coffee, yeah, and you see who drinks it, you see that Kurt Russell drinks it, and yep. whatever the guy was, OB. that was Ob 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 drinks it. And honestly, I'm not going to lie. I thought that it was the kind of poison that they just get sick. I, I didn't think anything. I was like, oh, yeah. they're just, just going to get sick. 
And then they start vomiting blood. And then they rip off the, the Evil Dead. Which I, I, I disagree. That, that Evil they, Dead no, remake? No, it's a blatant ripoff. Evil Dead remake? Yeah, it's a blatant ripoff. Evil Dead remake ripped off a bunch of crap then. Drag Me no, to Hell came uh, out before that. Okay, but it might hey, have. But this, say, is I, Quint, this is Quentin Tarantino, though. That, that's him That's him giving an homage to, to directors like Sam Raimi and other directors that, that he loves. And I, I, I didn't mind it. I loved that. I loved... I, the whole entire time that he was vomiting, I was like, I hope to God he vomits rotten tuna for Jason Lee's face. And he did. I was like, I knew it was going to happen. But I'm glad I never thought that they were going to die, and they died. That was a horrible death to, to die by. But since we're talking about Ob, funniest guy in the movie was Ob. Well, yeah. just that, maybe just that one scene. But that one scene. Well, but that Goggins one is the scene guy was. In the movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's in it the whole movie. That uh, scene's great. Uh, 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 James Parks, who plays uh, Ob Jackson. Yeah. Uh, he's just a he's a supporting character. He's a yeah. minimal character. But the scenes that he is in, he is funny yeah. as funny can be. The bear, the bear rug scene. Yeah, the bear rug is absolutely when he busts in. hilarious. When he, <laughs> he busts, busts in, in from you the cold. mother, I'm never going back out there ever again. The reason why that was funny because it, it didn't feel like it was a joke. Like it felt natural within, it felt within natural. the context of the yes. film, which is what Tarantino's really good. That reminded me of like stuff from Pulp Fiction. Yeah, in a sense. But uh, I'd say after the when the second half of the movie gets started, that's when people start the bodies start to pile. And people start to die because right off the bat, Kurt Russell and Ob bites it. Oh, definitely, they bite, they bite the dust very. I, really didn't, I didn't see Kurt Russell's death coming. Me neither. That I thought quick. he was going to make it the whole movie because he was such a good character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which I mean, within the context of the film, I can see why he died. I just wish he would have made it further. I'm like assuming him. that's why they put so much emphasis on the coffee at the beginning because Kurt probably, Russell probably. put a lot of emphasis on yeah, that how, coffee. How bad the coffee was, and how bad the it. coffee was, and then how and good it was when he made yeah. it. Yeah, and then it's ironic so, that, so, he, that so his it, own coffee. Exactly, so it's almost point, an ironic at this death. Point we got three deaths that we know of. We have Bruce Dern. We have a. Uh, which I don't even remember Bruce Dern's name. Old, old racist guy. <laughs> Bruce Dern. He was General. Uh, he was General. Uh, Sandy Bruce Smithers. Dern. Bruce yeah, Dern Smithers. Dern was amazing. He was probably the most yes. realistic character yeah. in the movie. Uh, General Sam So you, you have him dead, you got Kurt Russell, and you got OB dead. Right. And, and then, we're trying to figure out who, who did poisoned, who the, poisoned the, coffee. the coffee. Which brings our good buddy from Reservoir Dogs and Kill Bill Volume 1 got, and 2, which Michael I, Madsen. Which I found to be... I know a lot of people like him, but I found him to be the him and Tim Roth to be the weakest people in the movie. Well, Michael, I don't think they were given that much to do. Michael Madsen was was underutilized. He was. He really was. You know how how despicable that guy can yes, be. Yes. Yes. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was in a he was in uh, he was in Reservoir I think Dogs. He was in Donnie Brasco in, too, if uh, I'm not mistaken, and he's. I think it was him. I'll, I'll take a look. He. Uh, I, I thought that his character. He played Joe Gage, if I'm not mistaken. You're right. Yeah, uh, yeah. He. Um, he really just felt like he was there just so the name Hateful Eight could happen. You know what I mean? Like, well, like, honestly, that's how I kind of felt about him. But, like, when he comes in, the only thing he really does that really makes me dislike him is when they go, it's later on in the flashback scene when he kills, um, I guess I can go ahead and say it, when he well, kills, uh, yeah, yeah. once we get to it, he kills the help. Yeah. But we haven't really revealed a well, twist the thing, yet. Is so. that Samuel Jackson lines everybody up except for Walton Goggins' character because Walton Goggins was getting ready to drink the coffee. Yeah, he was. Yeah. So he knew immediately that he can't be involved in it. Yeah, he and, was. Which, which brought in some hilarious. Uh, I, I feel like Walton Goggins brings up that coffee throughout the whole entire yeah. movie after that, and it's, it works every time. So you got you got the Bob Bob the Mexican. Yeah. Line up. You got uh, Bob the Mexican, Bob the Mexican Tim, Roth, Tim Roth. You got Michael Madsen's character. Which it's uh, only three guys. You and got that's the only three guys in the line. That was the only three there because Samuel Jackson had the guns. Samuel yeah. Jackson, because uh, we we didn't talk about this, but uh, Kurt Russell's character had taken everyone's guns and had Ob go and put them in the outhouse because he didn't trust anybody to trust. Because yeah. he he had a feeling somebody was going to try and work to get um, Jennifer Jason. Lee's yeah, character. get her yeah. character out. So that was touched on. Nobody had any weapons that we knew of. Yeah. And Samuel except Jackson, for, except for Samuel Jackson, and well, Samuel Jackson had a gun, and he gave one to um, Walton Goggins. Yeah. And he, he said, "I know it. you didn't. I know you didn't poison the coffee because your dumbass was about to drink it." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. we end up with that. But I want to go back for a second. Who's like, trying to kill me? I didn't really get a chance <laughs> to chime in on the Samuel Jackson uh, sequence where he Monologue. gets. The monologue. Yeah, sorry about that. I great. honestly believe that happened. I don't. Here's know. why. Here's why. At the beginning of this movie, Samuel Jackson, Big they they, they, to, they they kind of toy with a thing called the Lincoln Letter. Yeah. We haven't touched base on that, and that's one yeah. of the, a big thing in the movie is the Lincoln Letter. And Samuel Jackson has Kurt Russell convinced that he has a letter from Abraham Lincoln, like they were pen pals. Yeah, like yeah. him and Lincoln were good friends yeah. because Samuel Jackson served in the cavalry. 
in during the Civil War. Well, you f- uh, flash forward a little bit. It is finally revealed what Samuel L. Jackson's character, why he's a bounty hunter now. Yeah. And yeah. it's revealed that Samuel L. Jackson um, was ran out of the, the military because of what he did to escape jail. Yeah. Right. And he ended up killing a bunch of Confederate soldiers and Union soldiers. And the Union Army didn't take very kindly to it, so he was kind of ran off. Um, And Samuel Jackson, Walton Goggins' character, actually calls him out on it and says, you're full of crap, that's not from Lincoln. He didn't say that, but, you know. And it kind of hurts Kurt Kurt Russell's character's feelings. Because Kurt Russell was really... He was attached to that letter. Kurt Russell cared so much for that letter. It it, it got him. It really (laughs) did. And Samuel Jackson hurt my feelings. And Samuel Jackson finally admits that he was full of shit and says that. And then he does this big monologue with with the general. Yeah. And it makes you think, okay, was this... Did this happen or didn't it? And I'll, and I'll get to why I think it happened later once we get to the end. I'll reveal why I think it was true. Okay. Uh, well, you know, we, we've talked about a lot of uh, the second half of the movie. Uh, the first half of the movie really was just character development and it was setting up building a, the plot a lot of, of the shootout. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, of course, if you don't know, if you're, if you're listening to this and you, you, you don't know anything about The Hateful Eight at all, and we've touched on what what it is so far um you know it's it builds the tension between why these eight guys hate each other but at the same time people by the end of the movie people are starting to work together with each other to figure out what's going on which brings us especially yeah the the big flashback to the third act yeah uh which brings us to to chapter five and chapter six i don't think anybody could have honestly predicted it's not one of those things that the, the twist blows your mind you just know that there's there's a there's an outside source here yeah. Uh, so the second that you see someone in the cellar shoot up, why no one checked the cellar? I'll never know. <laughs> I, I don't question it. It doesn't at. bother me. No, I'm questioning it. I know. I know. If 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 Samuel L. Jackson, Samuel L. Jackson knows everything about about Minnie's haberdashery. He knows everything about. It. He knew about the sign. He knew about the dogs. He knew about the hat. He knew about the door. He knew about uh, what the what uh the jar with the peppermint sticks and stuff in it. He noticed that stuff. You mean to tell me not one time they were hold they were all there? Nobody went into the basement. Here's why. Here's why I, I came up with it a while back. I, at least okay. I like to think I all did. Right. All right. I, I want to hear this. All so right. Go ahead. Here's why. Samuel L. Jackson's character. All right. He knows everything about Minnie's haberdashery because he stayed there so much. Now. Samuel L. Jackson, he doesn't know that if anybody's dead or alive. Remember that? Like, he is assuming this whole time. Okay, remember, he's I'm assuming listening. I'm listening. that they're okay, but he doesn't trust Bob the Mexican. Okay? Mm-hmm. He doesn't know. He just he said, I'm not calling you a liar yet. So he kind of believed him there for a while, and then things start to unravel. Yeah. Okay? There's a blizzard outside. That basement's a hole in the ground. It's not insulated. There's nothing that would prove that there would be anybody down there in this freezing cold. Because they're freezing to death upstairs near a fire. Why would anybody be underneath in, in the basement? Like he could have built a fire underneath it. Yeah, which, you would kind of notice which that. Is, which is odd. Because not necessarily. Not necessarily. If there was some sort of thing leading... Because the same thing with the uh, with what they made the coffee and stuff on. There's an exhaust that goes out of that house. There is. Here's the thing. Samuel L. Jackson knew everything about up, upstairs. The moment he calls Bob a liar, he's shot. He's that shot. That does make sense. He doesn't have a chance to go check the basement. Now, maybe had he not got shot immediately, then I'd agree it with you. It happens pretty quickly. But, but it honestly, does. Uh, and also, he's a patron there. The owners of the place aren't going to let him go down into the basement. So maybe he. I mean, granted, you see, you can see there's a little thing there, but how's he going to know to check the basement? Which all, which all leads up to our big cameo of the movie, uh, which would be Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum, which we you was talking about the no insulation in the basement. Channing Tatum looked perfectly fine after he got out of, he, out of the. He did. Like, he actually but, looked a little bit warmer than everybody else. He actually never made it out of the basement. Let's well, talk about that. His but. upper body made it out of his basement, and yeah. part of his upper body got blown off. Yeah. <laughs> but but oh honestly, my God, he that, was given up. I think Why that flash give up quick enough. I think the flashback scene to earlier in the day. I guess it was earlier in the day. Yeah. Uh, when you find out that Mark Madsen's character. Michael Madsen, Mark, not Mark Madsen, <laughs> played for the Lakers. Michael Madsen's <laughs> character, Tim Roth, and, and Bob the Mexican, uh, they basically take over the haberdashery and they kill everybody in it, it with the exception of Bruce Dern. 
and uh, they take it over so that whenever they Jennifer Jason Lee's character gets there, they can take her. Yeah, and save yeah. her from the hanging. Which is which is and the Channing Tatum. S- Channing Tatum is is Jennifer Jason Lee's brother. Yes, that's the big and, twist. And of they're the movie. A big they're big outlaws. They're they they all have a bounty over their head for like at least ten thousand dollars a piece. Yeah, uh, they all have ten thousand dollar bounty, and Channing Tatum's bounty is fifty thousand. Channing Tatum with the the brief amount of time he's in the movie, he's really really good. Yeah, he's it's dead. not it's not Chan- Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum gets <laughs> such a bad rap, but the guy is an actual not, really. Good actor. Now, nowadays, he, he's he's, he's getting it. he's getting what he deserves. I say I tell you yeah. why people people he's were so ragging on him. He was he was he's getting ragged on because of way back when when he started making all these movies that you know they were pretty much chick flicks. Let's be honest. Yeah, dear John. It was almost yeah. like it was almost like the Matthew McConaughey effect where he was yeah. just making chick flicks for a yep. while. Now, yeah, now and it, it sucked. Dramas. But now he's he's really coming to his own. He he I'm really impressed. Twenty One Jump Street. The, That's the, what broke the him turning, out. The turning point was Twenty One Jump Street and Magic Mike. Yeah, uh, and Magic Mike. He's great in Magic Mike too. T- also, but this is uh, this and is getting, a way different movie. Than and he's getting ever been cast in a Tarantino movie is no easy feat. No, like last, like uh, no in Django feat. and Chain, you had uh, uh, Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill. It's had funny. It's funny to see a movie where. You have Channing Tatum, who was actually coached by Samuel L. Jackson and Coach Carter. And Coach Carter, it, yeah. It, it never, I'm thinking there was a phone call. It, it made. Never actually shows uh, Channing Tatum play much basketball, but he has a couple lines. In he the does. Movie. That is a fact. Samuel yeah. L. Jackson and Channing Tatum have known each other. Channing Tatum yeah. was in Coach Carter. That is so. a good point. Thank you. Yeah, good but point. we, uh, but going back to the movie, um, we had, uh, we had our pivotal plot twist, and then we have. After that, we have the hanging of uh, Daisy Domergay. Yeah. Do- Domergu, sorry. Now, which, which, <laughs> hold on before we get too far ahead here, because we got to talk about this. Apparently, the, the, we kind of just skipped over the big shootout. There but, is, but, it's not a huge shootout. I don't think but we skipped over shootout. whatever I was talking about, the but blood not, splattering yeah, earlier. It's that's not, this. It's not, that's not a really huge it's shootout, just, though. It's just a lot of Samuel Jackson shooting dead bodies. And it's, and and it's just, yeah. and and it's just a very, and it's just a very bad like use of chain. slow motion. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that's another thing I didn't like. With the, the with slow motion the, was with the only thing that got given, me. Tarantino, like, giving a voiceover and the slow motion are the worst things in the movie for me. Yeah. I, and, and Tim I, Roth. I can give her to... Uh, see, by the, you know, by the end of it, it's revealed that he was just playing a character. Yeah. And it doesn't bother me as much now that that was revealed. Uh, but the blood splattering, I almost have to expect that in a Tarantino movie now. And it makes it enjoyable and funny. I just wish it would have been a little bit more grounded in reality. But uh, the hanging scene... Here's the thing about the hanging scene. Here's a, it's, it's a nitpick. Is that it? Did not look like a real hanging to me. Well, you got to remember, just, Samuel L. Jackson just had his testicles blown off. Yeah, but and I, you had another guy, well, Walt, Walter uh, Walton Goggins. Yeah, Walton Walt Goggins. Goggins. I can't shot remember the that. Chris, name. Chris Mannix. Chris He's Mannix. been shot several times. Yeah, and they're you both, have Tim both Roth. Char- Tim Roth character who is he's still alive at the end of the movie. He's as still far alive, as but yeah. he's struggling he's as struggling, well. Yeah. And they kill M- Joe Michael, Gage. Michael Madsen's Yeah, they kill him. Uh, because he tries to pull a gun. Yeah, and it's and all in slow motion, and it kind of sucks. Like, yeah, I, don't, I, wish I, did, I, I just wish it would have happened quickly. I didn't like know? the slow motion. I yeah. agree with that. But they try; they kill him. So the only people left alive now, Senior Bob got his head blown off. <laughs> uh, Ob, and, yeah, it was pretty. It, it, was, nah, it didn't bother me though. Jody Domergu is in the basement. Jody's with his head dead off. in one of the funniest scenes in the movie when yeah. Samuel Jackson shoots him in the back of the head. You don't see it coming, and they're going, "He was gonna surrender," and he, he didn't do it fast enough. It's pretty like the third act is really, really enjoyable. It really is. Funny. It's really like, enjoyable. It really is. And for a movie that's three hours long, it didn't feel it. Yeah, I really didn't feel the three hours. The pay the payoff of the third it a lot. The the third uh, the the payoff of the third act is. Probably one of the best payoffs as far as a a um, a three hour movie goes because the first the first hour is absolutely just setting up the first the main two characters the main yeah. three but, characters. But I feel like it's always entertaining because it's that Tarantino dialogue that's snappy. Right. Like you could right. they could really just talk and I'm like, well, there's yeah. a lot of stuff Tarantino happening. Tarantino could yeah. have t- Tarantino yeah. could base a whole movie on two old men in the park playing checkers, and it would be great. Right. Well, here's the thing I was talking about with the hanging. Here's why I didn't think it was realistic, which is really a nitpick uh, is that the way that Jennifer Jason Lee looked did not look like, it did not look authentic to me considering that this this isn't really a spoiler for you guys because I'm not telling you who it happens to or anything I just watched Fargo season 2 mm-hmm. and they show a hanging and it is devastatingly realistic like the way that they show the character his face gets purple and like his neck swells up and it just looks real like she just kind of looked normal Which and, and, and for a big budget Quentin Tarantino movie, I expected that to look a little bit more, more realistic, considering that he loves stylized violence. 
yeah. and it just did, that didn't look real, which is whatever because the the payoff there with Walton Goggins and Samuel Jackson laying in the bed together, it actually ends probably like the sweetest ending of any Tarantino movie where he reads the link the Lincoln letter, which brings you to why you think that Samuel Jackson was not lying about the story he told to Bruce Stern. Because he reads the Lincoln letter. And we're going to end with this yeah. because we're at 35 minutes. So uh, we're going to we'll, we'll end with this and we'll wrap up. Yeah. So, Nathan, let's hear your theory okay, about the Lincoln letter. Here's why I think letter. okay, the Lincoln letter, when you hear the, the what is actually read in the Lincoln letter, I won't go into detail about it, but it's so just vague. Mm-hmm. It's so vague. And there's nothing really like, there's no specifics. There's no, it, all it is is really a name. And then Mary Todd, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. That's it. Maybe Any, that's how anybody, Abraham Lincoln would have done it. I don't, well, <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. Yeah, like, I mean, there's no way of knowing. No way of knowing. Yeah. And it's not really specific. Okay. okay. And Samuel Jackson has been conning people with this one letter for how long? Long time. Okay, long time. Yeah. Now, he goes into gross amounts of details <laughs> With what happened to the with, general's son? Now with, the general <laughs> admits in this, his son came out to Wyoming, and another another line he made. I don't know if anybody remembers it. He said, "Maybe your son's out living here." And he goes, "If he would have accomplished what he came out here to do, he would have came home." Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now you get hostility from the general towards Samuel L. Jackson in the movie. I'm not saying that the general's not just racist because he, you know, he's clearly racist. Yeah. And at first you think, hey, this guy's just racist because he's an old bigot. Yeah. And he fought for the South, and he was racist. I'm thinking this guy knew that this is who his son was after. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think he knew. And I think he knew that he killed him. And he wasn't going to do anything about it because another thing is he was told not to do anything mm-hmm. or he would be killed. Yeah, that, you, you find that out in the flashback. And then he realizes he's going to be killed no matter what. So he just decides to go ahead and try to take down Samuel Jackson. And I think Samuel Jackson did those things to his son, and I believe that the story is true because of the amount of detail and the amount of, of work that Samuel Jackson put into it. And it didn't seem like he had to sit there and think about it because he just rambled it off like it happened. Here's the thing. In a Tarantino universe, everybody talks really great. That's another true. thing. So while I think he may have killed him, I don't think he... I don't think he raped <laughs> his son. Oh. Uh, orally raped his son. Because uh, that was just... I feel like that was just getting an old man worked up even more yeah, over I, the death I, of his I, son. I, I agree with that part But I do, I do believe he... I, I do I believe he, he killed, killed him, him, though. I think he killed him, yeah. I do believe that. Um, I as think far he added as in that other stuff for the, yeah. for the sake of getting him even more worked up. Uh, but that's a, that's a good point, though. That's that's a, yeah, really, it's a very yeah. good point, actually. Um, so, that brings us to about 38 minutes in our podcast here. Um... Caleb, closing closing statements. Here's the thing: uh, there's I have the, the little problems with the movie. They almost pale in comparison to the scope of the movie and how it's a, just a, a marvelous cinematic experience. Like after I watched it, I was like, I was like, ah, the last two Tarantino movies I watched, I watched again. I didn't like them as much, but it, I don't think I was looking forward to watching them again. This one, there's specific scenes where I'm like, man, like I kind of can't wait to see that again. Which brought boost. I originally gave it a four point six, and today I'm giving it a four point eight because I'm thinking about things. I remember everything that happened in this movie. Yeah. It's not a forgetful movie, and I think that this is the most underrated movie of the year because this is Tarantino's worst reviewed movie of all time, which still has pretty good. I think it has like a seventy seven on Rotten Tomatoes, mm-hmm. and I think this deserved about a ninety or something like that on Rotten Tomatoes because this is a like an abruptly like entertaining movie from beginning to end that's just dark and funny. And always entertaining. So yeah, um, I would I would say it's Quentin Tarantino's funniest film almost. Um, it's from the yeah. ones I've seen. From the ones I've seen, um, it, which it, honestly, Pulp Fiction. I, I I've only seen a handful of Tarantino it, films. That's Pulp Fiction, the Kill Bill movies. I always say that. Reservoir I always Dogs. say that. Like I think after watching like Glorious Bastards and Django, I was like, man, that's probably the funniest Tarantino movie I've seen. Then I watch it again. Like no, like this movie goes on so long. And I don't th- this movie. Like it felt a lot tighter than those movies because right. it because it was in a such a tight space yeah. with such a condensed cast and it just had to focus on this one thing. So that's why I think this this is his best movie since uh, Jackie Brown. I'm gonna go with it being Tarantino's. It's not as good as Pulp Fiction. I don't know about Jackie Brown. I don't. I'd have to I honestly. It's been so long yeah. since I've seen Jackie. Yeah, me Brown, too. But yeah. I'd have to watch it again. I don't know where I would rank it. I do think it's it's better than the Kill Bills. 
Well, you haven't seen Kill Bill Volume 2, so you well, can't Well, it's better than Kill Bill I, I Volume 1. I think it's one. a little better. Just for me, though. Like, maybe um, not for some other people. I can, I can just tell from the type of movie that Kill Bill is that it's going to be better. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love I love Kill Bill. Yeah. But it's better than Django. It's better than Inglorious Bastards. As much as I love Inglorious Bastards and Django, I think it's better. Um, it it's either his second or third best movie yeah, to you, me. You've never seen Reservoir Dogs, though, right? I not all of which it. which is his which is his tightest movie because uh, it all takes yeah. place. It all honestly that's sort of like this. It all takes place in a warehouse with guys trying to figure out who who ratted out and told the cops that we yeah. were doing this this job. Yeah, I it mean, all takes place. I've it's seen like some of it, but yeah. I haven't really got to dive into it like yeah. I want to. It's probably his his most focused movie. But honestly, uh, this movie did not disappoint me at all. I was really a big fan of it, and, and I was a little worried going into because I saw that it had some negative reviews, and it 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 surpassed my. Here's the thing with me with Tarantino: I go in with really high expectations yeah. because I do like him so much. Um, I'll, this is definitely going to be one I'll have to buy, and and you know I will buy it because I've really enjoyed it. My it was one of my top three favorite movies of the year, and I really can't I I can nitpick a little bit the the slow motion is the only thing I really didn't like. Yeah, Other it wasn't that, even funny. Really, the slow motion wasn't even funny. No, yeah. and outside of that, it wasn't. Other than that, I'm I'm very yeah. happy with the movie, yeah, and very, I would go see. Movie. I would go see it in theaters again. Honestly, I would, t- dude. If it comes to Logan, um, I'll, first on my objective is the Revenant, which I think we need to, next week. We'll go watch the Revenant. And we'll review that. Uh, yeah, but uh, right after I watch the Revenant. I'll go if this is playing. I'll go watch it on Tuesday for five bucks. I might go take yeah, my dad. I mean, it'll be, it be fun to watch. It's a really fun movie to watch. In it the is, it and really like is. you said, like it starts out, and it just builds and builds and builds. It's just like a, a nonstop tension building movie, and it ends. And then we talked about it, it ended on a pretty positive note. And yeah. on the third, and on the third act, it's just an in-your-face. Um, oh yeah, shootout which, practically. Which, then everything unravels. Tarantino so. does does a uh, give a voiceover twice in the movie. But it, it's over like just like that. It's just him doing something that he's been wanting to do. So you, you can't fault him for it. I, it, just, it just didn't work for me necessarily. But overall, I, I, I love this movie. I thought it was a blast. Yeah, definitely fantastic movie. I highly recommend it. All right, so that wraps up our special review of The Hateful Eight. Uh, we hope everybody has enjoyed it. Check out the other episodes. Check out the other podcasts. Check out the movie battles. Check out everything that we are going to be doing coming up here very soon uh, with some special events and some more reviews coming out. Uh, for Movies to Movies, I am Josh. For Caleb Luther and Nathan Bush, we hope you enjoyed the episode. And have a great evening and have a good night. <laughs>